Hello and welcome to our big match build-up show as Southampton prepare their first visit to the Molyneux in nine years since the championship to play Wolverhampton Wanderers. Now last week was certainly not the tales of the unexpected as Saints perfectly played into the hands of Liverpool at Anfield. So this week hopefully should serve as a chance for Saints to push on and redeem themselves on the road once again and try to gate crash the Portuguese party at Wolves. So coming up on this week's show, a new face and the uncensored opinion from League One minus 10 and hoping that this weekend is not going to be a Disney classic. It is going to be a hard game um, and the longer they leave Adama Troy off the pitch, I think the better for us because if they, if they put him up through the middle then we've got the same problem as we had last week where we've got you know, we've got Bambi and Bambi's mate at the back trying to keep trying to keep pace with him. And on the opposition view this week, I asked the old gold and black what to do with Wolves and his fear of Saints strikers. We've been very, very good at home since Nuno came in. We've only lost two games and the last one of those was back in January against Nottingham Forest. When we get the first goal as well, we win. I know you've got a few striking threats. Danny Ings is doing, doing quite well recently, but there's nothing really... I don't know that this will come back on social media, but there's nothing really that makes me scared about the uh, Southampton's attacking lineup. So do let us know where you're watching from or listening from. The episode is available to download in the card above my head if you're watching on YouTube and available on most audio platforms in the links below this video stick with us later on for your alternative away travel and your away day pubs for wolves but let's kick off this show and our build up for wolverhampton wanderers versus southampton So welcome along to our first half of our match build-up show as Saints are looking forward to a trip to the West Midlands to the Black Country this weekend. And we've got another debutant on the show uh, this season. It's, we put a, a face to the name this time. Uh, our guest this week from the irreverent, uncensored opinion, League One minus 10, uh, Glenn Delacour. Uh, welcome to the show, man. I mean, how are you doing, mate? I'm good. I'm good. Yeah. Thanks very much. Thanks for the build up. That's uh, that's good. Yeah. I think. Um, yeah. A few people have probably seen my face on your um, on your season preview shows, um, but it was only a couple of seconds, so it was easy to skip around that. So uh, I hope I don't scare too many off me. Yeah, we saw you a few times, and thanks for sending your clip in for the uh, end of season oh, and, and, the, and the preview for the season as well. But as we do sort of every week, we'll ju- we'll briefly touch upon the uh, the previous game. And I'm sure, uh, yeah. well, we were just saying off air that let's try and forget this game as quickly as possible. But we'll take a quick look back. And as we just said, you know, it's it's a game that wasn't unexpected. It's a sort of same old story, conceding at set pieces, the zonal marking. I mean, is that an easy excuse? Well, we coughed up three goals. When, when you play when you play against the big clubs, the top six clubs, you have to be perfect and that you can't make any horrible mistakes. I mean, they the chances are they'll beat you anyway and you cannot afford to, to make horrible mistakes. I mean, I, I remember when we'd gone to places like Man United before and we won 1-0 relatively recently, you know, our centre-backs were perfect, our central midfielders were perfect and we were probably perfect on Saturday for all of three minutes. Um, and, you know, Lamina got the ball away up the other end of the pitch. They broke them from that. They scored the first goal, you know, the own goal. Second goal was terrible. Third goal was terrible as well. You know, it just, it, you can't, you can't cough up three goals against anybody. Um, you know, we coughed up two goals against Brighton and didn't win. Um, they were they were both preventable. Um, and I, I guess Liverpool at Anfield, you got no chance. So, yeah. Yeah, and it's a Liverpool team that looks, you know, looks on on fire at the moment. Now it's seven wins, yeah, exactly. six, wins out, six wins out of six at the moment. And, full marks really in the Premier League but for me it was a defeatist attitude before we even kicked off uh, obviously without Danny Ings ineligible to play against his parent club and we play 4-5-1 with a striker that's only scored twice in about two years I was hoping to avoid the Shane Long question because I'm getting quite a lot of trouble on Twitter <laughs> over that um, yeah it, it, it does my head in I mean you know strikers if a position needs a confident player it's it's a striker and, and Shane Long you can tell he's he's terrified 
he'll run around and he'll chase lost causes and occasionally he'll get to the ball but you know then what he, he's got no confidence whatsoever at the moment um, you know back in the day we used to stick people in the reserves or strikers you know you stick them in the reserves for a couple of weeks they'd hopefully score a few goals against lesser opposition and then you'd stick them back in the team when they learnt it um, we don't seem to use the under 23s for that though I think you still can put overage players in there if, if you want to so it's obviously not Shane Long's fault he's picked but going with just one up top and it being him you, you're you basically saying our furthest forward player is not a goal threat and I didn't see the wingers getting in the box much either so you know there was not much going to happen at that end of the pitch well before kick off we, we were limited of options so Danny Ings ineligible couldn't play Gabby Adini picked up an injury Elianusi out of injury as well so yeah. really only had Shane Long and Charlie Austin and Charlie Austin's a, a, a box player really isn't he and he can't play 90 minutes so you, you're struggling to start him in my opinion because it's a premeditated substitution that you have to make on 60 minutes because he's blown out of his ass by that point. I thought it was interesting Hughes kind of building him up a little bit before the game saying Austin's been really sharp and looking good in training. Well, yeah, that's all well and good. He still can't run for 90 minutes. So, you know, he, he can't. In, and a game like Liverpool away where the strikers are going to be chasing around a lot is just not the game for him. So that was the one decision I think, you know, bearing in mind the choice he had, I think Hughes got right. But um, elsewhere, I don't under, didn't understand the Matt Target thing, unless it was to double up on, on Salah, who was, you know, I assume supposed to play up on the right. But as it turned out, Klopp didn't play him there. Um, I didn't understand that. I didn't understand bringing Romeo in. You know, I've... I've Sorry, I could understand bringing Romeo in, but I would have thought they would have benefited more from having a centre-half in between the two big slow guys that we've got at the moment because if anything was predictable, it was that Mane and Salah were going to rip us apart back there. And, you know, it was just horrible to watch Vestergaard trying to keep pace with Salah. It's just like the definition of suicide. You know, let's let's keep trying it until until something goes wrong. And, yeah, I think Mark Hughes had a bit of a wonky one on, um, on Saturday and it didn't work at all. It's almost a case that you're watching through your hands and, and begging for mercy against Liverpool. You know, three and a half, so you think, surely this cannot get any worse. And, and you know, thankfully it didn't. But the three goals are almost sort of like watching a, a, a Three Stooges sketch, you know, a Wesley Hoot own goal where he can't he can't uh, figure out his feet. Uh, Matip out jumps the, the giant of the Premier League, the tallest player outfield, and Salah's the first one to react uh, from a free kick. Yeah, I mean, I've seen a lot of people go to town on the zonal marking thing, and, and it is it is interesting that, you know, Vestergaard was too deep. So he was sort of like coming out desperately trying to get to, was it Matip? Matip. I mean, that was a good header to be fair, but I don't know who was, you know, the way zonal marking is supposed to work is that there's supposed to be someone sort of blocking that area. And I don't know if there was no one there or, um, like I say, I've only seen it once, I didn't bother with the highlights. I don't really know if there was anyone there or whether it was some, you know, it's a, one of the smaller players, like that giant in the air, Cedric. Um, you know, I, I don't know what happened. V- Vestergaard was too far away. Now, you know, for me, Matip is their tallest player. So if Vestergaard marks him and Hoyt Van, marks Van Dyke, then hopefully that's their two biggest threats gone. But, you know, whispered off five yards, defending a zone. And yeah, and when you've got defenders as tall as we've got, I don't get it. I really don't. Yeah, well, it is the uh, the tallest combination in the Premier League and, and they're still marking thin air, but I'm sure there's more formulas <laughs> to figure out. It's a math, mathematical algebra equation to figure out why we keep uh, marking thin space. But the bottom line is it's, it's five points from, from six games uh, and we've now yeah. got a sort of a, 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 a tough run of fixtures coming up. And once again, the, the, the first set of fixtures are favourable, but we are notoriously slow starters. Yes. Yeah, it, it's it's happened the last few seasons. Um, was it last year we had favourable fixtures at the start or the yeah. season before where you, know, you were looking at it and hoping that Pellegrino was going to be up and running and we were going to make a decent start and we didn't. And uh, yeah, last year, I mean, we got away with it in the end, obviously, but there were so many parallels with the season that we went down in 2005 where we had this run of winnable home games. I mean, it was actually around October and November and I think we only won one of them, which was against Pompey. Um, and if you if you don't pick up points, you know, against the teams that are going to be around you, you are going to struggle. But I mean, the good news is, is that, you know, there, there is a hell of a long way to go, of course. But we have shown no real signs yet of being able to, you know, put away teams we should put away at home. 
So until that changes, but I, th- I don't think it's a quick fix. You know, we've had we've had two years of this, really. I don't think it's something you can really wave a magic wand at. You know, these players have been um, been affected by the by the failures of the last two seasons. So they, you know, it's going to be a long job to get that out of the system. Yeah, and I think so. Perhaps they've been brainwashed by the two negative managers that we that we've recently had. And and I think Mark Hughes admitted that in one of his recent interviews yeah. that it's going to be a long job. It's going to be it'll take a while to get these bad habits out of the system. But got to look forward to uh, to Wolves. Though I mean, they are they're looking quite comfortable in their return to the Premier League. It's nine points from six games. What, yeah. what have you seen of Wolves so far this season? Um, not a great deal. Just sort of match of the day highlights. But when you look at it on the face of it, they've I think they've only lost once. I yeah. think they've only lost once to, to Leicester and apparently they deserve to win that one. They've had good, you know, they played City at home, got a point. They've played United away and got a point. We'd be happy with that, that's for sure. So, yeah, they, they certainly don't look like a side that's remotely going to struggle, um, but they spent the best part of 100 million in the summer. So, you know, they shouldn't do really. They shouldn't be struggling. They'll comfortably finish, you know, if not top 10, just below it. Um, don't anticipate them being anywhere near the bottom. With the um, with the players they've got, the manager they've got, and the, the style of football they've got, yeah, they're looking pretty comfortable. And I would say that they should finish around tenth. And the, already yeah. they're looking quite confident. But what should our ten, our intent be? Should our approach be different to to the Liverpool game? I mean, Danny oh, obviously obviously is going to be yeah. a huge boost to return to the team. I mean, I'm, I'm of the opinion that anyone who's not in the top six, you you go there to get on the front foot and try and win. I mean, Wolves. Wolves have scored six and let in six, I read somewhere. So apparently they create quite a few chances, but they don't take many. So you can you can read that either way. They could be due to hammer someone. <laughs> or or they, you know, they just struggle to stick a ball in the net, much like ourselves. So I don't know, maybe it's a game to keep it tight and and um, and try and pinch one. But uh, I've had two years of that. I'm kind of bored with that with that approach, you know. I, they, they, they're good but they're not that good you know we, we could, should certainly be on their level so I don't see why we can't go there and be positive and, and, and try and get a result I want to see us express ourselves play them at their own game uh, by all means I've seen Wolves press play hard at the pitch and uh, over the last few weeks and well years really pressing hard at the pitch is bad news for Saints well, the other thing that's interesting about them which I didn't realise until my mate pointed it out is that they've had the same starting lineup in all six games so far so that shows that the manager knows his best team and he, you know, and those players will know what they're doing. Um, we at times look slightly disorganised. Um, you know, we had one formation all the way through the summer and now we've dumped it and gone for a new one. That's looked good in short, short spurts, but we've never managed, you know, a decent 90 minutes. Um, possible exception of Crystal Palace, but even then we were under the cost for 20 minutes before the second goal. Mm. So it is going to be a hard game. Um, and the longer they leave Adama Traore off the pitch, I think the better for us because um, if, they, if they put him up through the middle, then we've got the same problem as we had last week where we've got, you know, we've got Bambi and Bambi's mate at the back trying to keep trying to keep pace with him. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's a bit of a scary one. But um, I think the, the key is going to be in the midfield. They've got Moutinho and Neves in mid um, in midfield who have been excellent so far so it's up to Hoiberg and um, hopefully hopefully Romeo I've, I've had enough of Lamina for various reasons um, you know I'll, hopefully those two will, uh, will win the battle in there yeah those two uh, their biggest threats you'd say Moutinho and, and Neves combining together their Portuguese yeah. connection and playing an international team but there's Two contrasting memories. I want to take a trip down memory lane. So the last time we uh, we visited the Molyneux, we got stuffed 3-0 on the way down from the championships. And just reading into it, I'm watching back the highlights just a minute ago, and it's it's almost a, a stark reflection, almost exactly the same that we've had the problems over the last two years. We've we, On that day, not uh, eight years ago, nine years ago, uh, we conceded three goals from set pieces. Two from corners and one penalty. What do you remember of that day? Nothing whatsoever. <laughs> I, I I remember winning 4-1 when Klaus Lundigbam scored. And I remember a freak game where we won 6-0 when Saganowski scored a hat-trick. Um, I don't remember the 3-0 game at all. It's I try, because um, I'm a little bit older now, I think... 
probably when I was younger, those sort of games would stick in the memory and I would be in a bad mood about them for months. But I try and do the Nigel Atkins thing now and draw a line under the absolute <laughs> shockers and uh, and move on. So I don't remember that game at all. I mean, one thing I do remember, we played him in the League Cup last year, didn't we? Second yeah. game of the yeah. season. And it was Santo's second game in charge. And even though it was their reserve team, uh, against our reserve team basically they played us off the park they absolutely played us off the park they were a championship side then um, and it was pretty you know looking back now you can see that he had hold of that team pretty early on um, I remember being really impressed with them and then looking for their result the following week and being really surprised that none of those players were playing mm. so the, you know the guy obviously knows his stuff and he's probably they won't like this but he's probably going to move on to bigger and better things at some point um, but he looks, you know, he look, he looks the real deal as a manager. They always do, don't they, managers? And the other the other memory uh, you've already touched on it six nil win. Uh, the the two years before that, so two thousand and seven, eleven years ago. Uh, I think it's fair to say that Saints have selective memories. A lot of us will uh, will remember that six nil game. So yeah. one for the viewers as well, one for the listeners. Can you name that team from two thousand and nine? Uh, it's on the way down from the championship in two thousand, uh, and, and when we had the administrative uh, uh, deductions so if you can from that selective oh. memory uh, let us know but uh, Glenn let's wrap things up then for this part of the show uh, what are you hoping for what's your prediction for the weekend I'm hoping for a win I really am uh, you know I'm, I'm hoping that we bounce back strongly uh, Danny Ings will make a huge difference up front um, will he play Shane Long again I think he probably will um, so I'm hoping for a wouldn't it be nice to win 2-0 you know, similar to the Palace game where we, you know, control the majority of the game. Um, I don't think that will happen, to be honest. So my my prediction, and I'd be happy enough with this, is a one-all draw. I think it's fair to say that uh, if we get anywhere near that 6-0 win again, we'll be in dreamland <laughs> to take away from the uh, West Midlands. But big thanks, Glenn. Just tell the, uh, the listeners and the viewers where we can find you if they want to read your blog. Most of the interactions that I do now are through Twitter, so um, just look for, uh, what is it? It's an at, at sign, isn't it? At L1 minus 10. Uh, that's where it is. The the actual um, blog itself is easy enough to find. Just Google League 1 minus 10 and you'll see um, some of the filth and bile that I've written will come up uh, readily for you to uh, feast your eyes on if that's what you want to do. Great stuff. All the best, mate, and we'll speak again All soon. Right, Thanks very much. Cheers, A big thanks to Glenn for coming on this week's show. Uh, do make sure you check out his blog, League One Minus Ten, for your uncensored, unfiltered opinion on Southampton Football Club. It's a wonderful read if you've got some time to kill. But do let's hope uh, we can draw some positives from this weekend. What is ahead of a, a few of a tough set of fixtures can anyone find us the formula to the zonal marking and why it's backfired so spectacularly recently or more so let us know some of your memories from the Monu from years gone by but another away day to a ground that might be new to some and it wouldn't be complete without a guide to some of your local boozers for a pre-match tipple or two now as far as we're aware Wolverhampton it seems to be quite unfriendly to the travelling away fans not just Saints but in general and most of the the pubs near and around the ground demand to see your home ticket now the only away allocated pub that we are aware of is apparently the Blue Brick which is by the Premier Inn just by the Wolverhampton train station and to get into the Blue Brick they'll charge you £2 for the privilege so what most people are doing then including ourselves we're going into Birmingham to have a, a drink and then taking the train into Wolverhampton where it's only a 15 minute walk to the Molyneux from there but if you are looking for alternative travel then our favourite coach providers Southampton away travel are laying on extra coaches to get you to the West Midlands and priced at $23.95 with 15 available pickup points and inclusive of free food and drink 4G Wi-Fi and on board entertainment all the details are available below and also for the upcoming fixture to Everton uh, next week in the League Cup so now it's time to kick off our second half of the show as I chat to our opposition 
Tom from the old gold and black. So welcome along to our second half of our match build-up show and Saints looking forward to a trip to Le Molyneux for the first time in nine years. So I've scoured the internet once again to find our, our Wolverhampton Wanderers friend who we spoke to last season, but now they're back in the Prem. Uh, be a regular fixture on these sort of things across the, uh, the YouTube community. So I'd like to welcome back to the show uh, Tom also known as the Old Golden Black, the Wolves Channel. Really good to see you again, uh, Tom. How are you? Very good. And with the results that we've had so far, very, very good. I'm feeling quite positive about the rest of the season ahead. So a lot of people, um, you know, said Wolves, they'll be fairly comfortable this season. I mean, our expectations meet in reality at the moment. How are you settling back to life in the Prem? Well, I think it's, it's a little bit difficult for us to sort of realise what our expectations actually are because... As a newly promoted team, obviously the main objective is to just stay in the division. But with the players that we've signed and the football that we've played and how competitive we've been in every single game, even against Man City and Man United now recently, it sort of feels like we should be pushing for a top 10 finish. And then the way that we played against United on Saturday, you could argue that we we dropped two points in that game. And so why can't we look at the top eight or the top six even uh, eventually later down the season? But I think it depends on what happens in January if we can bring in that clinical striker that I think we've been lacking if you watched our game against Burnley you'd have seen all the chances that we had and we should have killed that game off but it's generally a very very exciting uh, time for the Wolves and what's coming out of the club from the owners in, the, in their ambitions is quite unbelievable really considering where we were two years ago yeah it's amazing to see sort of clubs do that and you know perhaps Saints uh, started that sort of template maybe years ago but you know Wolves are playing a lot of expressive football at the moment you mentioned new signings how are they adjusting so we've got uh, Rio Patricio and Jao Moutinho joining the Portuguese party and yeah. along with uh, Leandro Dendonca right is yeah. that right yeah yeah uh, although he hasn't played in the league yet OK. And we've also got Adama Traore and Raul Jimenez. How are they all getting on? Uh, they've all settled in pretty well. Apart from Dendonka, who, as I said, has only played in the League Cup. He might play tomorrow against Leicester uh, in that game. But I assume he will do. But Patricio, he's proving that he's one of the top goalkeepers in Europe. Some of the saves that he's pulled off against Man City, his free kick save against United as well. Uh, he's already won us you could argue five points with his performances single-handedly. The defence has stayed the same as last year, pretty much apart from Johnny Castro Otto, who's come in from Atletico Madrid on loan, but he hasn't played for Atletico. He's just come from Celta Vigo and they've loaned him straight out. He's been exceptional as well. I think he's sort of been overlooked because of Patricio and uh, Moutinho and how good they've been. But um, he's a right-footed left back. And in pre-season, we were not sure about how that was going to work. But he's been his reading of the game is tremendous. And he's been getting forward a little bit more. He's offered a little bit more defensively as well than Barry Douglas did for us last year. Uh, Moutinho in the middle, he's just an absolute luxury of a player to have. It's almost like my dad compared it, in fact, to when you buy uh, a new... When you, buy, when you buy a puppy and you've got an older dog, and the old dog sort of learns, teaches the new dog. That's exactly what we've got with Neves and Moutinho now. They're exactly the same player and the same mould. And Neves is going to be a much better player for playing alongside Moutinho in that respect. Uh, Jimenez up front as well. He's doing well. He's getting in good areas and, and he's working very, very hard. But he's not been as clinical as we would have hoped. He's getting in those areas for the chances, but he's not putting them away. And Traore, you can set your watch by it. He will come on with about 20 minutes to go and he'll cause your fullbacks trouble within that last couple of minutes. But I think he's he's not quite trusted yet to start a game because all he wants to do is get his head down and dribble. And I think Nuno wants him to do a little bit more than that, be a bit cleverer on the ball. So a couple of things. Um, I, I remember reading an article or hearing a, a report about Ruben Neves, how he admired Gian Moutinho. So those two working quite together, worrying uh, for, for Saints in midfield on Saturday. But Adam Traore, you know, I don't know how much you keep up with the FIFA ratings, but he recently was uh, number one for the speed, yeah. 96 on pace, and he really showed that the London Stadium breaking through and, and yeah. scoring the winner a few weeks ago. Yeah, and as well on uh, on Saturday with Luke Shaw was on a yellow card with 20 minutes to go. It's the last thing he went then is Troy, and they were just lumping the ball over the top. Usually we're quite steady in our approach, but it was sort of, right, well, Shaw's on a yellow card. Let's get the ball to Troy and make Shaw make a tackle and 
time. We, we were able then to pin Man United back where they should have really been coming at us in the last few minutes. But we had them, we gave them something to think about in the last uh, few minutes. So he's he's definitely the fastest player that we've got. I don't know whether the fastest in the league, but if FIFA says so, I'll go by that. Well, according to the world, he's the fastest player. But <laughs> Traore, he was on Saints radar and, and I'm really glad that we didn't actually go for him. So we'll sit 10th now with nine points after six games. And you touched upon some of the Manchester games already, but a vital point at Old Trafford, perhaps you should have won it, you know, by all means you were the better team for most of the most of the, most of the game and you know you've also picked up a point away at the Etihad at, at you know the champions from last season uh, well no that, that was at home that was but uh, still a point against Man City anywhere I think is a bonus point but I've people have you know United fans have been teasing me in school in work now saying that you know oh that was your cup final but really this game against Southampton is a bigger game because that was a, a bonus point against United and these are the games really that are going to decide where we finish in the league if we pick up three points on Saturday then we you know sort of solidify that mid-table uh, going into the next international break in a few weeks What do you think the approach should be at home then obviously uh, this is a, probably a favourable tie for Wolves on paper um You've obviously gone up to Man United and played in our own game. What's the approach going to be this weekend? Well, if you've watched the Wolves game so far this season, you will have watched every Wolves game this season because we play in the same way, home or away. It doesn't matter. We steady on the ball, composed. Uh, we try and impose our game on on the other teams. We don't let them come and keep the ball and things. We harry and press when we haven't got the ball. Just wait for the right moment. The Everton game, I think, was a perfect example of that. When we were 2-1 down, the players were still being patient and passing the ball around the edge of the 18-yard box, waiting for that killer ball into the box. And we got that in the end with him and Ezzy's goal. Um, defensively, we're very, very sound. With the three at the back, uh, Cody in the middle, um, and then Bolly and Bennett either side. Bennett as well, who's been a revelation since he came in for free uh, last season. And then the fullbacks bomb forward, but they also drop back. So we're five at the back when we haven't got the ball, three when we have. And it's very, it's quite difficult to play against. But I was thinking the other week about what weaknesses would we have or what weaknesses would other teams think we've got. And I think at the right side of our back five with Doherty and Bennett together, I think teams might look to target that, the sort of... Ben, it's not particularly quick in comparison to Bolly on the other side, so that may be uh, something that teams want to target. And the fact that I mentioned earlier that Johnny's right footed playing on the left, that could, you know, there's possibly some issues there, but it's the first time that I can look at a Wolves team and say there aren't real gaps in our team and it's quite amazing really yeah it sounds like bad news all day long we, we were pressured <laughs> up, up the pitch uh, at Anfield and really gave the ball away far too easily and, and we played into their hands hopefully Saints don't repeat that sort of performance but Wolves I, I hear that you've been unchanged in the last six Premier League teams Premier League yeah, and games yeah, and I imagine that'll be the same on uh, Saturday because we're recording this now before we played Leicester. That'll be a big turnaround. There'll be a lot of changes for that game. But I do imagine that we'll, it will be exactly the same team. And all the substitutes as well almost are the same every time, the same substitutions at the same minute in the game almost. For the benefit of the viewers and listeners at home, talk us through the team. Uh, right, so uh, it'll be Rui Patricio in goal. Uh, then Cody is the sort of sweeper in the middle of the back three. Uh, Willie Bolly to his left Ryan Bennett to his right uh, then Johnny Castro Otto as the left wing back Matt Doherty who Martin O'Neill will refuse to put in the island team at right wing back <laughs> Martinio and Neves as the middle two and then you've got uh, Diogo Jota on the left hand side Raul Jimenez in the middle and uh, Helder Costa on the right hand side and I imagine that will be the team the substitutes may be slightly different they, I think they've been pretty much the same as well four or six games so far but uh, Ivan Cavallero I think is close to fitness Dendonka as well is close to fitness so those two may come in on Saturday but I very much doubt it I think at the moment and according to the reports it is likely that Dendonka will get some minutes on Tuesday against Leicester uh, correct me if I'm wrong it's only Bennett and Cody that re retained their places in the previous round in the Carabao Cup um, Nuno is, is likely to play the youngsters uh, on Tuesday night and it was around this time last year we met in the uh, in the same competition with with your youngsters yeah that's right and I remember that sort of being the the spark well for me anyway seeing these the second string play so well against a fairly strong team of yours I remember and 
you know, coming away with a, a away victory in the cup was was very very good. But our second string now are far better than that team because they've had a year of playing under Nuno. All of them, they know the style, they know what the expectations are, and you know they've all got places to play for in the Premier League. If there's any injuries or suspensions, there's a Premier League place up for grabs now, and there's far more of an incentive. So I am looking forward to the game on uh, Tuesday, but Saturday's the real. Uh, the real prize. So, what's your what's your intent then on uh, on Saturday? Then talk us through uh, your prediction. What what, what are you thinking? Well, uh, we've been very very good at home since Nuno came in. We've only lost two games, and the last one of those was back in January against Nottingham Forest, when the team looked a little bit jaded after the Christmas period. Uh, when we get the first goal as well, we win. Or I think we'd, we've only blown a lead a couple of times at Molyneux. So, if we can get that first goal we'll win the game because I can't see I know you've got a few striking threats Danny Ings has done doing quite well recently but there's nothing really and I know that this will come back on social media <laughs> but there's nothing really that makes me scared about the uh, Southampton's attacking lineup really so I'm going to go for a Wolves win uh, with a clean sheet for Wolves as well either 1 or 2 nil. Well, I'm sure two goals and 61 appearances for Shane Long uh, strikes fear in the heart of defenders. <laughs> but, uh, big, big thanks, Tom. Uh, before you go, tell everybody where we can find you. Uh, so if you on YouTube, it's the old gold and black. I think on uh, Twitter, it's the old gold 1877. I'm not, not even quite sure about that, but <laughs> YouTube where is where it's at, the old gold and black. So big thanks, Tom. Thanks for joining us. You're welcome. Thank you. So a big thanks to Tom for joining us on this week's show. Be sure to check out his channel for all of your Wolverhampton reviews and previews to get all your needs for the old gold and black. But that does pretty much call full time on this week's show. Be sure to leave us your predictions, any tips you might have for our travelling fans to Wolverhampton. Uh, get involved in the conversation below or get in touch with us on the usual social means. We'll try and share and retweet some of your tips uh, for match day this weekend. So a big thanks for watching. A big thanks for listening. We'll see you on the road at the Molyneux. Come on, you saints.